from the vibrant streets of Mumbai emerges as, uh, you know, we can share a tale of youthful ambition and, uh, swi and swift success. Adit uh, is just uh, 22 and, um, you know, he's somebody who's turned the quick commerce sector on its head with Zepto. The startup is now valued at over $5 billion. He dropped out of Stanford to chase a vision. Adit was then just 17 years old alongside uh, Kaivalya Vora. They crafted a platform delivering essentials in minutes, uh, redefining uh, convenience. Their journey from Zepto's inception to 2021 to becoming India's youngest unicorn founders is not just a business story, it's a beacon for dreamers everywhere, proving that with innovation and daring, the future can be delivered today. Thanks so much for being with us. Question number one. When you told your parents at the age of about 18 that you were dropping out of Stanford, did they show you the door? <laughs> no, no, first. It, yeah, it's on. Yeah, no, firstly, it's wonderful to be here. <laughs> Thanks for that generous introduction. So, you know, no pressure for the rest of the session. But uh, to answer your question, I think, you know, although it's, you know, on the outside and it looks like a very, um, you know, sort of cliche Silicon Valley story, you know, we dropped out of college to start a company. You know, actually, before we, we took that step, Kevali and I, we were basically tinkering around for about a year. And, you know, as kids, we loved coding, right? We were, um, we used to build out small projects for fun. Yeah. Um, growing up, but you know, in the middle of COVID, we didn't really have much to do. Uh, we were supposed to go to California to study. Obviously, all of us got put back into Bombay in that first wave of the pandemic, and we didn't really see the value in online education. So, you know, we took a call uh, to you know, instead of wasting a year of that experience, let's just take a year off and just tinker around and build some interesting stuff. Most of our Peers at the time at Stanford had internships at Goldman Sachs or Google. We didn't really have any of that lined up. And we just took a call to, to start experimenting. And How did you think this up? Yeah, no, we were just, you know, the two of us were uh, sitting in Sherry Punjab and Andheri East. Uh, first wave of the pandemic, you couldn't get groceries delivered. Um, you know, the offline options were all usually shut down. The online options at the time were taking six, seven days to deliver. And so we started with the WhatsApp group. And over the course of a year, we kept tweaking and iterating on the model, kept talking to customers, mm -hmm. and you know, started building out the first version of Zepto probably a year after we launched that WhatsApp group, and got to a meaningful scale, which is when we took that call to to drop out, right, formally. Um, and I think you know, the parents obviously it was a shocking moment, right? I I remember you know, Kevalia's mother burst into tears and said, "What have you done to my son? Right? You, <laughs> you've you've brainwashed him." Uh, but you know, I think we had some real numbers to go back off. We were doing at that time. Uh, a few million dollars in revenue and growing fast, and we had just raised, or we were about to raise a large amount of capital. So we had some substance behind what we were doing, and you know there was real customer love. So we could take that conviction based, that con that call based on data, uh, and not just sort of gut feel. I know the story is a little bit more exciting if it was just like a crazy idea, but at that time we had some numbers and we had some scale, and then we took the call. So at least. You know, our, our fathers were a little bit more comfortable with it when they saw the numbers. So, so, yeah. so when you went to when you go to Kevalia's mother now and say, "Ma'am, my valuation is five billion dollars," <laughs> what does she say? Go back to school? Yes, pretty much. She just says that. Yes, she still says, "What a beautiful life you've given up on at at college." But but yeah. I'm just trying to understand why did you pick ten minutes as opposed to fifteen minutes for delivery or twenty minutes? So. Like I mentioned, we took a year just talking to customers. And you know, at Zepto, you know, we're a customer company, right? That's the way that we call ourselves. And and when we when we were speaking to customers at the time, you know, most grocery in India is bought hyper locally, right? Most of the people told us that, you know, for them to really order multiple times a week, it had to be, you know, seamless, as easy as going downstairs and picking up, you know, fruits and vegetables or picking up day-to-day -day packaged foods. And we took it as more of an ambition, can we sustainably, structurally at scale, do 10-minute delivery? We launched the first you know, micro warehouse or dark store in Bandra in Mumbai, and that's when we experimented with it. And we realized, you know, after a few months of iteration, that, hey, this is actually possible and scalable. And that's when we took upon ourselves to go to the extreme lens. Like, we, don't, we didn't think there was any more, anything more extreme than 10 minutes. And we said that, let's push ourselves to actually deliver this for the customer. Um, and like the last panelist said, right, like, if you do something good, um, you know, profits will follow, and that's what we've seen, right? Like, you know, because the retention and customer love is so high, um, and be largely because of that 10-minute delivery promise, 
we've been able to see some pretty incredible economics and scale in this model very quickly, which is why you know, people are excited about quick commerce generally. But in India, when it rains, it pours. Gurgaon gets flooded in five minutes, Delhi in about 10. Uh, and yet you promise 10 minute deliveries. You know, there's obviously some nuance to it, right? Like obviously if it's you know, raining heavily, then we, we, we don't deliver nearly as fast. And when you open up the app, you see a live ETA. So you, you might see six minutes, you might see 11 minutes, you might see 14 minutes. In a flood, you might see 24 minutes, 25 minutes when it's in a heavy rain situation, or maybe we can't service it at all if it's heavily flooded. Uh, so obviously it fluctuates, but the median today is about 10.6, 10.7, like what we're live tracking towards, so, so yeah. You know, we don't talk very much about gig workers, do we? Uh, and we should. Uh, these are the people who, in a sense, are, um, you know, literally drive the company. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a cliche, but they, they actually are the transporters. It's difficult, it's hot in India, it's cold in India, the conditions are difficult, the traffic is crazy. So how important are, are the people, the men and the women who are gig workers, who are part of your business? No, absolutely. I mean. You know, our philosophy is to add value to, as, to all our stakeholders, right? customers, um, you know, the workers that we have across the business, and obviously then shareholders in that order, right? And you know, we look at adding value to a delivery partner's life as a core part of the value proposition of Zepto. And interestingly enough, you know, the more value you add to those delivery partners, the more retention that you have in that fleet, the lower your costs become, and the, you know, the better your overall business outcome becomes as well. So we don't just look at you know, goodwill to delivery partners as a you know, social initiative, we look at it as actually a business objective, right? And, you know, as a result of that, if you look at the way that we've, you know, built out this delivery fleet, we've basically gone from zero to 50,000 delivery partners that earn a livelihood on Zepto in 36 months, right? Effectively 50,000, uh, you know, people now have sort of, you know, steady, stable, consistent income uh, very quickly, and that's rapidly expanding. And how have we added, you know, value to their lives? You know, from our perspective, you know, we do things that, that we are proud of, like for example, giving them, you know, the ability to do doctor consultations, vehicle repair and insurance on their vehicles, you know, even things like term insurance, right? Um, we go a little bit above and beyond. We're constantly trying to innovate as a team. Like we've got a dedicated engineering and product team that's just constantly trying to figure out how we can add more value. So for example, you know, one of the, when, when I speak to delivery partners and when our team speaks to delivery partners, one of the things they talk about is, you know, cash flow access to capital that's cheap. So we said, okay, instead of paying them every week, can we pay them every day? Mm -hmm. Can we pay them every hour, right? So we're going to like the, uh, to even crazy lengths to solve some of their problems. And if we can't do that, then we partner with, let's say an NBFC to give them lower cost of capital and we negotiate on their behalf, right? And so, you know, from our lens, you know, we are always on the lookout to add more value to them. Obviously there is a marketplace, right? There is, you know, structural forces of demand and supply in the labor market. Um, but we do try, you know, our philosophy at, at Zepto is how do we unlock more productivity so that we can pay them more or pay them in a stable fashion instead of this race to the bottom where we constantly keep chipping away at, at their income. We don't think it's productive. We don't think it's sustainable. Uh, we think real efficiency unlock and then, you know, sharing that efficiency is a real way to compound. Uh, so in a nutshell, you know, everything from, you know, the basics from health insurance to vehicle insurance and other, other benefits all the way to, you know, cash flow visibility, innovations on, you know, how we pay them and solve for, you know, day-to-day -day problems, all the way to, you know, you know, new things that we're trying to figure out, um, like, you know, giving them flexible, like pure play flexibility to work, even if they want to do, let's say if you're an MBA student and you've got two hours in the afternoon, can we create a, uh, you know, a gig worker style program for you to give that MBA, you know, of income of 8,000 rupees a month, if not a full, you know, 20, 25,000 rupees a month, which still makes a huge difference. We keep trying to do these innovations to add value and genuinely, genuinely we're good faith. And the last thing that I'll mention, sorry, is that, you know, even with stakeholders in the government, right, we are always, you know, open to feedback and suggestions. So, you know, we work with state governments and if they genuinely feel like there's a better way that we can add value, we're obviously open to it with, like I mentioned, the real constraint of demand and supply and labor that we have to all adhere to, right? Uh, but yeah. No, so when you look at uh, AI and uh, the way the technology is, is improving, where do you see, for example, for me as a user, the interface change, let us say five years down the road? How would it be easier for me and how would it possibly be premised on 6G coming into India? Well, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, for us, you know, what's a little bit interesting about our company, and you'll see this with most of the startups, is that we have that 
Silicon Valley product and tech DNA. So we have like a high performing, you know, engineering and product team that we've built out pretty methodically in Bangalore to be able to genuinely build like real systems that can add value on data science and artificial intelligence. So for example, you know, we have a, an advertising business for let's say the Unilevers and Procter and Gamble's of the world to bid on search keywords at Zepto uh, and to get like ad placements live on the platform. And we're making hundreds of crores of revenue of that. That's pure bottom line because it's just advertising. And that engine that we built in-house, that we call Jarvis internally, mm -hmm. um, you know, all the, you know, the ranking engine, the bidding and attribution on that ad stack, uh, you know, all of it is powered by data science and machine learning models. And we built all of that in-house and it's taken us some time to do it, but we built it relatively quickly. Or for example, to your question as a user, mm -hmm. what's different for the user today that we can actually do with, you know, data science and machine learning systems. So search is one of the biggest things that we focus on. So how can I just, you know, look at your search history and personalize results for you so that you are getting relevant products, right? If you sit in Defense Colony versus if you sit in West Delhi, there's a difference in what you want to see, mm -hmm. right? If you've got an iPhone versus you have an Oppo phone, there's a difference in what you want to see, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? If you've, if you've looked at, you know, feminine hygiene products, and that means you're probably a female customer, can we push more products that are more relevant to you? So constantly building that relevance to make the user's buying experience better. And then the last thing that I'll mention is, you know, there are, you know, interesting things that we're even doing on our selection. So how can we predict store by store, micro market by micro market, um, what a customer would want, looking at, you know, the tens of millions of data points that we have historically. And that's actually helping us improve our selection. That's helping us get sourcing leverage to improve our prices. So, you know, everything from the search and recommendations to the advertising business do we have to the supply chain. There's a lot of machine learning that we already use today. And then down the road, you know, as we speak, for example, we're working on a generative AI solution on customer support, hmm. right? So instead of waiting for 30 to 45 seconds for a human being to respond to you, why don't you wait like, you know, two seconds and then uh, a generative AI chatbot will respond to you and do a better job, candidly, than even a human could do in that, that format. So we're working on it and we think it'll add real value to customers. What's the average age of Zepto? The age of a Zepto customer? Yeah, of your, of, of your workforce. For workforce? Corporate workforce would be around 29 or so. 20 so you're still younger than your average workforce. Way very younger. much. I'm younger than the interns. You know, I keep right. getting that. Uh, you know, I keep getting that feedback. But yeah. So how do people in the workplace sort of deal with you? They see you as this 22-year-old <laughs> boss, who's 22 is like old for you. You started when you were much younger. How does that <laughs> dynamic work? Well, I think the the culture that we're building at Zepto is is uh, fairly substance-based, right? Where uh, we're pretty methodical, rigorous supply chain style culture on one hand, and then on the other hand, you've got this like technology and engineering culture that's very aggressive and innovative. But it's all rooted in one key thing, which is execution excellence, right? And that's the that's the one thing that we've believed in since day one. And I think you know, it's taken some time, but you know, with with the team that we have, and candidly, you know, like you mentioned, most of the people are my the people that report to me are mostly almost double my age, right? Mm -hmm. And they I'd say are some of the best executives in internet in India today, right? For example, the CFO of Mintra, uh, who's now our CFO, or you know, top tier, you know, tech leaders from the Flipkarts and the Amazons of the world, right? That have joined Zepto, you know, you know, they report to me, and I think you know it's taking time, but hopefully, Kevale and I have been able to prove our ability to add value and go deep into the details and actually uh, run tracks rigorously ourselves and execute, and I think there's a mutual respect of that you know, execution and strategic thinking that comes from the top management team and us. And that's basically what's ended up happening. So, you know, it's, it's substance-based. Hopefully we've shown some substance so far, not all the way there yet, but I think, you know, the team has a little bit of conviction that maybe Adit has some idea of what he's doing. Uh, and so they, they give me that leeway. No, no, I'm, I'm sure they do. Expansion, obviously, key on the cards. Right. Uh, and that comes with a, a whole set of challenges because every market is different. Uh, and, you know, markets for you are tiny. I mean, you don't necessarily look at a, a state as one monolithic uh, form, right. you know, I mean. It's, yeah. So how do you actually decide to expand? Absolutely. So, so I'll give you a little bit of history, right? We've, uh, we've had a pretty interesting journey at Zepto. We've gone from zero to about 10,000 crores in volume in two and a half years. So fastest growing internet company of all time in Indian history. Uh, and we're very proud of that. And even on you know that base of 
over a billion dollars in top line. We're growing pretty rapidly even as we speak, expanding into new markets. So for example, in the past 90 days alone, we've launched cities like Nasik, like Chandigarh, like Jaipur, uh, like Lucknow, like Coimbatore. So, you know, we are actually launching new cities as we speak. And, you know, the framework is straightforward, right? You know, we start city by city, what's the descending order of priority? We're looking at e-commerce data, we're looking at food delivery data, we're looking at, you know, all the data that's available out there on population density, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever we can, whatever we can get our hands on that's publicly available. And we rank, we've ranked cities, and we've done this exercise a while ago. And then in descending order of priority within the cities, then there's a fairly rigorous process on mark, micro market by micro market, what do we launch? Um, and so we've got a network design team that's just dedicated to that. And we're looking at, you know, again, we have an algorithm that looks at a few data points that we can plug into our model, right? Like for example, a, um, let's say how many you know, restaurants do we see in this micro market as an indicator of consumption or how many you know, high rises exist here? What's the you know, average you know, flat per society complex that we see, et cetera, et cetera. And then obviously some subjective data. And then we rank all the micro markets within the city and then we try to prioritize them. But you know, at this point we're expanding pretty meaningfully. So you know, wherever we can get our hands on a property, we move fast there. Uh, but it's a fairly methodical, boring process that we've built out over time. Uh, and you know, so for the past 18 months or so, we've obviously been you know, slow on expansion from a geographic perspective. Obviously, within our existing markets, we've grown pretty rapidly, largely because you know, capital was difficult to come by 2022, 2023. We were constrained on you know, the ability to invest in CapEx and launch new stores. But obviously, now we've you know, proven the economics to a great extent. We've been able to raise capital, and now we're expanding pretty aggressively uh, geographically. Absolutely incredible story. But before you leave, one last question. How at the age of 22 now, do you deal with the fact that you're a phenomenally wealthy human being? You run a company with a market valuation of $5 billion, and that I believe is said to go up. How, does, that, does that affect you, your lifestyle, or do you just keep working and pegging away with ideas? Look, not much candidly, right? I mean, we started this company without the intent of starting a company. You know, both Keval and I just were really excited about building uh, interesting things. And, um, you know, we love what we're building. Like, we work like crazy. You know, the people from my team here that know, you know, the, the, the way that we work. But uh, we just are genuinely so excited about what we're building. And I'll tell you what actually motivates us, right? It's not really about, you know, money or personal wealth. Because candidly, you know, working like 80, 100 hours a week, we could have probably worked half of that with a lot less stress and still been, been doing fairly well, right? Uh, at a certain point, money becomes inconsequential. But what's exciting to us, and I think what's the theme of this entire summit, is that you know, if you look at large internet outcomes globally, in the US or in China or in you know, parts of Southeast Asia or in Latin America, people have really built companies that generate, that have gone in the span of a decade or a decade and a half, have gone from zero to 70, 80, 90 billion. You know, I mentioned that last time we spoke as well, right? Very large outcomes where companies generate hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars of cash flow, like world-class companies in internet like Uber or Airbnb or Coupon or Mercado Libre in Latin America or obviously the Chinese companies, Meituan, Pinduoduo. And candidly speaking, and we have to be open and honest about this as a startup ecosystem, we've not really built a world-class internet company of that scale in India to date, right? We don't really have a company that does a billion dollars of free cash flow and has compounding cash flows at scale and has created tens of billions of dollars of Value with one or two exceptions, right? But really large outcomes still yet to be seen. And we think we have a shot at really building out an exciting company. And if we do it, um, there's a huge amount of value that we'll add, not just to you know, shareholders, capital markets, but to the startup ecosystem at large. Like if you know, Zepto and companies like, for example, Zomato, build very large outcomes, 60, 70 billion dollar outcomes, and are generating thousands of crores of cash and compounding, then the entire startup ecosystem we think will 5x, 10x from here. I mean, if you look at, candidly speaking, a city like uh, Shanghai today yeah. has a larger startup ecosystem by market cap than the entirety of this country, right? And we don't want that to continue. We want to 10x from here. Right? We don't want to grow 20% a year from here. right? And that's the excitement and promise of India. And so we think if we set the flag for that, it can be like a flip cart moment all over again. Uh, so that's that's basically what what Super. really keeps us excited and working the way that we're working. So so that's so that's you that. were 19 when Zepto became a unicorn, right? I think so, yeah. 
something like that, right? Something like that. Well, I'd like to thank uh, you very much for being with us. Uh, Adit Palicha is the youngest unicorn founder uh, in the country, and that remains the case, not just when he was 19. Um, Zepto has a market valuation of $5 billion, and that's something that's likely to rise. Uh, it just goes to show the spirit of, of the, the courage and the conviction that he had in his ideas, and to chase a 10-minute model, which most of us would say is impossible, um, and look at where he is as a young person, uh, you know, deciding to take this by dropping out of college, and that also Stanford. Um, but it is absolutely incredible to have you over here today, and thank you so much, and all the very best for the future. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank very kind of you. Thank you.